Hi everyone, I'm Renee, and I thought that when I wrote a book that I could just hide in the mountains and be a hermit introvert author, and that's not the case. Um, and so I'm terrified of public speaking, but now this is my third event and I'm getting a little better. But what I really would like is to draw you all in to the conversation eventually, because this book is really about you, even though it's about me. And what I, the book is about me being in a Buddhist cult for seven years and being brainwashed, severely brainwashed. And the complete shattering that came with that realization. Um, and, but I realized as I started to get over the shame of telling this story is that we all have these incredible stories and we think that something shouldn't have happened to us or we're embarrassed that it happened to us or we're ashamed that we made bad decisions. And for me, writing this book was so cathartic and I realized it's time for us all to be proud of our stories. And the stuff that happened to us that we think shouldn't have happened to us is actually part of our destiny. Um, I call them divine wounds. And I believe everything that happened to us actually happened for us. And so I really am hoping that that's one of your takeaways from tonight. Um, so, I'll start reading and then I'll explain a little bit more about my life as I go. I've never done this format before. Um, being interviewed is a lot easier. But um, okay, so this is how I open the book. This is the very beginning, the preface, the first words. Every one of us beats ourselves up in the privacy of our own minds. We think we're supposed to be better in some way, wealthier, stronger, more successful, thinner, smarter, a better parent, you name it. We cannot stand the fact that we are flawed, imperfect, human. So we spend our entire lives hiding our shortcomings, apologizing for them, blaming others for creating them, and hating ourselves for having them. By the time we hit adulthood, most of us have created such a false sense of self in an effort to cover up our inadequacies that we cannot even remember who we naturally are. So that's the first paragraph. Then further on in the preface, I say, life dealt me some pretty heavy blows early on. I was introduced to death at a young age, overly sensitive and very small. I never fit in with other kids and I was constantly beat up and teased until I became mean. I was raised by an unbalanced mother and was told continuously that virtually everything about me was wrong. I began searching for the meaning of life before I finished high school and was always desperate to find someone, anyone, who understood and appreciated me. I spent almost all of my young adulthood lost in searching. From the outside, my life looked perfect. I traveled the world as a model and professional dancer, but inside I was soul sick. I felt incredibly alone. And then with the end of the preface, I say, Dr. Maya Angela once said, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. I believe she is right. I wrote my story as a catharsis, a way to get it out of me so that I could heal and move on. It is my sincere desire that somewhere in the depths of my story, you see your own, and that my journey into, through, and out of the dark may help shine light on your own rocky path. If you've been struggling to forgive others, maybe my story will help you recognize that everything that happened to you has happened for you. And if you've been struggling to forgive yourself, maybe, just maybe, my story will let you give yourself permission to love all parts of you and all parts of your history. Embrace your skeletons in the closet. Pull them out and paint them pink. Celebrate them. Your skeletons are probably the most interesting part about you. Your difference is your destiny. And then I have a quote by Isadora Dun Duncan that says, you are wild ones, don't let them tame you. So I was raised Catholic and that didn't really work for me. Um, and I always had this innate love for God, but I didn't, all of the rules and all of the damnation and all of the sin and all of that that came with the Catholic church, it didn't resonate. And then most of my family died before I was 15. And my father died on Thanksgiving day when I was 15. And I just thought there has to be more than what I'm learning in church and at school. There has to be, it doesn't make sense that we could fall so deeply in love with each other only to lose each other. And so I began searching and I searched, I traveled the whole world, 50 countries by the time I was 35. Um, I studied all different religions. 
I slept with a lot of different men looking for love. I drag raced my Mustang. I dove off the stage at punk rock concerts. I just had self-destructive tendencies and wanted to feel something that would fill this void inside. Well, when I was 33, I walked into a tantric Buddhist meditation seminar and I found what I was looking for. And this is that moment. It's the introduction of my book. All my life I had been searching for what exactly I did not know. And then one evening in June 2006, I walked into a meditation seminar in California. I arrived late to a crowded room filled with chatter and nervous energy. 50 banquet chairs faced a low stage upon which sat a small round table draped in black cloth and a single beautifully upholstered chair. An elegant arrangement of flowers stood in the center of the table. There was one empty chair in the front row on the right. I sat in it just seconds before a woman walked onto the stage. I had been expecting the speaker to be an older woman with long gray hair, wearing sandals and a white robe with mala beads around her neck. Instead, she was a young woman, a pretty woman. She was dressed in an expensive black business suit with sexy, sophisticated black stilettos. With grace, she walked to the middle of the stage, faced the audience, and then slowly looked from her right to the, her left, scanning the eyes of every single member of the gathering. She oozed confidence. She radiated power. Her look was piercing. The room went quiet. When she had finished meeting every single pair of eyes, she smiled, placed her palms together in front of her heart, bowed slightly, and said, hello, I'm Lakshmi, let's meditate. She sat down, connected an iPod to a cable on the table, put on dark sunglasses, and hit play. Her posture was perfectly straight. Her feet rested side by side on the floor. She turned her head to face the audience and folded her hands in her lap, a large gold ring glittering on the third finger of her left hand. Music started. It was loud, and the sound echoing off the walls startled me. I had been expecting spa music, but the song she chose was Navras from one of the final fight scenes in the second Matrix movie. Wearing the dark sunglasses and the dark suit, this woman looked like Trinity from the movie. Damn, she was intense. Suddenly, I envied her. I pushed my thoughts aside, inhaled deeply, closed my eyes, and settled in to meditate. Instantly, I felt energy uncoil at the base of my spine and shoot up through the top of my head. Then everything went white, and I disappeared. The room disappeared, and I was being held in the hands of God. I had left my body and expanded into eternity. The peace, the silence, the warmth, the love, this was what I'd been searching for my entire life. This was it. I was home. I had never felt anything so glorious in all my life. I felt ripped apart and filled up with love and energy and white light and pure joy. I felt utter ecstasy. I slammed open my eyes, my heart beating wildly, and I clutched the bottom of the chair to keep from fainting. I didn't know who this woman was. I didn't care. I was home. My search was over. So that was the first moment I sat in front of the spiritual teacher. And you can imagine, I was hooked from that moment on. And then she went on to say, in the East, people have these beautiful spiritual practices, but they're, soul, uh, they're poor. And in the West, people make all this money, but they're soul sick. And so what she was going to do is teach us to sharpen our minds through meditation and then use our career as our spiritual practice with every moment and offering to the divine. And then that would allow us to get promoted, make more money, create lives where we could meditate better, and give back to the world through philanthropy. So I said, sign me up for that. That sounds great. I didn't have a strong mother figure. She was an alcoholic um, and emotionally abusive. And so here I was at 33 with this woman saying, not only am I going to teach you to find this incredible peace, but I'm also going to teach you how to have a great career. And I wanted to become enlightened. <laughs> And in my mind, what enlightenment meant was that I would live in peace inside my mind no matter what was going on, and that I would radiate that peace and love to everybody around me and make them feel this sense that everything was okay when they were in my presence. And I thought I would do anything for that. And, and I decided at 33 that's what I wanted to dedicate my life to. So I started following this woman. Um, and so then... 
to flash back to my childhood, I had this great editor and she said, okay, we can't just talk about your time in the cult, we have to flash back to your childhood to, to let the reader understand why you would make these decisions to join a cult. And when I went through this big shattering and put the pieces back together, I realized I had to go all the way back to childhood and discover where I had betrayed myself every single step of the way. So this is the beginning of chapter two and it is called Childhood. And I grew up on a boat in the Bahamas. So again, I had this dream life, but I was soul sick <laughs> inside. The sharks were swimming by, getting closer with each pass. Nurse sharks, they were only nurse sharks, but still they were bigger than I was. And I was tiny, 10 years old and all alone, standing on an inverted bucket with the tide rising steadily by the minute. My brother Gary had dropped me off to collect seashells. He was supposed to come back but that was over two hours ago and I was beginning to think he forgot. The year was 1983 and I was on a sandbar in the Bahamas. Well, two hours ago it had been a sandbar. Now it was just water with nurse sharks all around, swimming by me in the creepy, powerful, prehistoric way that they swim, rib cage swinging side to side, tail undulating as a result, dorsal fins rising above the surface of the water and sinking again just as fast, huge heads full of teeth. I was scared, but more than scared, I was pissed off. Where was my brother? This was just like Gary to forget about me, to get so wrapped up in fishing he simply forgot. Right now I had two choices, stand on the bucket and wait for him, hoping he'd arrive before the tide covered the bucket, or swim across the shark-filled water to a bank of mosquito-infested mangroves then start walking barefoot over hot, spiky lava rock until I found my way to the main island. The swimming would be bad, but the walking would be worse. So, again, from the outside looking in, I had this beautiful life, and there was no dialogue out there about having everything and still feeling really sad inside. So I thought I was the only one. And as I went through this process, I realized that we all have that feeling inside that nobody understands us. And what I discovered is, of course nobody understands us. We're the only version of us there is. There's eight billion people on this planet and each one of you is completely unique, so no one will ever see life the way you see it. No one will ever know what's going on inside your head and inside your mind. And so for me, that was so liberating because I finally stopped searching for somebody else to understand me and I realized I have to understand myself and then I have to do what feels, fills me up and then I can go out in the world and try to understand others. Um, so that was a big epiphany for me because when I was always searching for other people to understand me, I was getting in all these toxic, abusive relationships. Um, because I was so desperate to be loved. And so at the very end of the book, I say, a part of me believes we have all brainwa been brainwashed to some degree. Anytime we believe we're unworthy, we've been brainwashed. Anytime we believe we're ugly or stupid or not good enough, we've been brainwashed. Anytime we believe we need to buy another product to be happy or hide our sexuality to fit in or cut into our faces or body to be beautiful, we've been brainwashed. We're bombarded with messaging that tells us we're not okay the way we are. It's time for messaging that tells us the opposite. There's room for all of us with all of our diversity and each one of us is incredibly worthy. By believing in and loving and being true to ourselves, we add our light to the sum of light and we shift the consciousness of this planet from fear to love. Is there anything else more worthy of our time? So there's another part at the, towards the end where um, I say, people have asked me because I did get ordained as a monk and people ask me what my takeaway is on religion. And I say, when you're walking towards light and community and forgiveness and compassion and understanding and patience and kindness, you're walking in the right direction. And when you're walking towards fear and hatred and isolation and condemnation and self-righteousness and judgment, you're walking in the wrong direction. And it doesn't matter what the label is on the door or on the building or who's talking. I just discovered that we are beings of love. 
and we come into this world as these pure, perfect, gooey beings of love. And then we're taught from the second we arrive that we're not okay, that we have to be quieter, or we're too messy, or change to be accepted, or do this to make money, or don't do that because you're not being a lady, or whatever it is. And so then by the time we become adults, we have no idea who we are. And I think that it's an epidemic of this deep depression. Um, and so I just would love the read, my readers to take away, and it is like a stepping stone path out for me, um, of how you truly love yourself and how you start to strip away the facades of the pieces of you that aren't real to live your true authentic life. And it's messy, and um, you'll make mistakes, and we all make mistakes, but there's so much joy in it. So I went from suicidal and not wanting to be here anymore to living this life that's so uniquely mine that I love it. And then because I love it, I'm happy. And then because I'm happy, I'm kind. And then because I'm kind, people are nice back. And suddenly it's this upward spiral of love and kindness. So I'd love to answer questions. And then I can talk more about the story if you want me to. <laughs> how I realized I was in a cult. So there were signs all along, and I really parallel this to any toxic relationship, is when we're honest with ourselves, there are signs all along, and we just ignore them. Um, and so, and this spiritual teacher was brilliant, and I think a lot of spiritual teachers do this, as they say, you're trying to become enlightened, you're trying to become more spiritual, so you need to, we were told, sand away our ego which was more get rid of the parts of us that were more human um, and not saintly. And so she started, like any toxic relationship, they build you up. If you go on a first date and somebody hits you or verbally abuses you, you're not going on a second date. But they start with romance and they build you up and they make you feel seen and loved and cherished and understood. And then they manipulate more and more of your time. And then you don't have time for your friends and family or the activities you love. So your support structure starts to go away. And then they introduce the self-doubt. And what I learned is those of us that are drawn to these types of relationships or these types of groups are already filled with self-doubt. Um, so when somebody starts to introduce it more, we just think, well, I am not good enough. You're right. Or I'm not smart enough. So. So there were signs all along. She started increasing the tuition. She started having me do selfless service to the guru, which started with just event planning, and then it became running her company, and then it became cleaning her house and doing her errands and um, letting her treat me badly whenever she wanted to. And then um, so there were signs there. She talked us into burning everything we owned, which I did. And then I went to her house and saw that she had everything that she had ever owned. Um, but I was so desperate to become enlightened. And, and she had said, this is tantric Buddhist mysticism. It's the hardest path there is. Anybody can act saintly in an ashram on top of a mountain, but try to act saintly in a subway car in Manhattan after working 12 hours a day. And she said, it's the warrior's path, and you're going to want to quit. And so every time I wanted to quit, I thought, I cannot go back to life the way I was living it. I have to fi find this enlightenment. I have to find this peace inside my mind. And, and my wanting to quit is me wanting not being strong enough to walk this path. So every time there were signs, I talked myself into staying. I think that the fact that you're going from place to place and telling people that it's OK to feel that way <laughs> is beautiful because this is the piece that gets, gets missed. It really does get missed. There's nobody out there talking about that deep, deep sadness inside and feeling like nobody understands you and you're all alone, which is fascinating because there's 8 billion of us, and yet I would venture to say 99% of us feel all alone. And and it's hard, this human condition. And so what I, I spend 90% of my time alone now. And I, I say when I go into the world, I get in, feel good, get out. And what I learned is when I fill myself up and I do the things that really bring me joy, which is a lot of meditation, a lot of time at home alone, but I love snowboarding and mountain biking and biking and surfing. Then when I'm filled up and I go into the world, then I make it about how can I be kind and present for others. And that brings me tremendous joy. And then it doesn't matter 
what they're doing or not doing, and if they understand me or don't understand me. Um, what matters is that I've had this interaction out in the world where I'm present and loving and kind, and I'm filled up when I go home. But when people are mean to me, I cry. When people ignore me and just act like I'm in the way, I cry. I'm very sensitive. Um, and I think that that just comes with being a hypersensitive being. And so, but now I realize it has nothing to do with me. Um, so yes, I think that there needs to be more dialogue about this feeling of being deeply alone. Other comments? Feeling our wounds too. And healing our wounds, and what I realize is we're all wounded. So the people that act like they're not wounded, they're just usually acting better <laughs> than we are, um, and they hide it, but we're all wounded. And so I wanna, I'd like to read you this. This is in the beginning of the preface. It's a folk tale that I found. And when I first found it, it just dropped me to my knees. An elderly woman had two large pots, each hung on the ends of a pole, which she carried across her neck. One of the pots had a crack in it, while the other pot was perfect. At the end of the long walk from the stream to the house, the whole pot delivered a full portion of water, while the cracked pot arrived only half full. For, two, for a full two years, this went on daily, with the woman bringing home only one and a half pots of water. The perfect pot was proud of itself and its accomplishments. The cracked pot was ashamed of its own imperfection and miserable that it could only do half of what it had been made to do. Finally, it spoke to the woman one day by the stream. I'm ashamed of myself because this crack in my side causes water to leak all the way back to your house. The old woman smiled. Did you notice that there are flowers on your side of the path, but not on the other pot's side? That's because I've always known about your flaw. So I planted flower seeds on your side of the path, and every day while we walk back, you water them. For two years, I've been able to pick these beautiful flowers to decorate the table. Without you being just the way you are, there would not be this beauty to grace this house. And so after that, I say, if we, ever want, if we ever want real peace inside our minds and subsequently in the world, we must understand that each one of us is unique. There is no carbon copy. Only then will we stop expecting other people to see and do things the way we would. Only then will we stop expecting ourselves to be further along than we are, to be somehow better. Only when we can truly accept and embrace our flaws will we be able to accept and embrace each other's. It is our work to not blend in, our work to stay true to ourselves, and our work to unravel and eventually understand the divine purpose in the parts of ourselves that are not the norm, to discover the incredible power and wisdom that lies hidden in the owning and forgiving and healing of our wounds. Each one of us is designed differently and perfectly. Each one of us is damaged differently and perfectly in order to fill our own unique destiny. And so my damage, I was weird. I was the weird, sensitive girl, kid, that was too small. I was sickly, and I was oversensitive, and I was clairvoyant and clairaudient and psychic. And so as a kid, I was proud of those gifts, and I told everyone about them and immediately realized it terrified everybody around me, and I hit them, and I shut them down. And then I tried to be the bad girl, kid, that just was like everybody else and ended up being completely brainwashed because I put somebody who knew much less about spirituality and what was right for me on a pedestal and then just bowed at her feet and let her tell me what to do. And only now am I finally waving my weird flag and saying, yes, I am psychic and clairaudient and clairvoyant and, and, and empath. You know, I feel what anyone's feeling if I look in their eyes. And, um, and it's a beautiful gift. And so, Questions? Any more questions, comments, Darno? Um, what prompted you to write the book? This was a catharsis. It was, I had been living in New York, and because I was so far away from my own guidance system, I entered into a terrible business relationship with a sociopath and um, lost a lot of money and moved to Colorado to heal, and I began writing. And it, it was pouring out of me, and it was a catharsis, and it was about 700 pages of journal entries. And I had so much shame around the story. And then 
I started to tell people close to me a little bit about it, and they would all say, that's fascinating, you should write a book. And so I finally said, I think I am. <laughs> and then as I healed, I started to realize I want all of us to own our stories and to love ourselves and to really look at where we were wounded and how we can help others because of that and how we can understand others because of that. So I decided to publish it. I realized with PTSD, because I had severe PTSD from this, um, that for me what PTSD really was, was not wanting what happened to have happened, um, not wanting to be changed because of it, and thinking that what happened should not have happened. And I realized finally by reading Byron Katie's Loving What Is, if it happened, it was meant to happen. And for me, I had to believe in the divine. I, faith was a huge part. I had to believe in a divine plan. And so I had to believe that everything that happened happened because it's meant to. And I read a lot about Sri Ramakrishna, and he was one of the, they say, like the most enlightened being that ever incarnated in India. And he would always say, as soon as man realizes he's not the doer, he's free. Meaning, in his mind, God is always working through us. So everything we do is an act of the divine. And so that really helped me forgive myself because I had so much anger with these people for brainwashing me and making me burn everything I owned. And she convinced me finally that I was a witch and a sorceress and a devil. And so I was so angry. And then I realized that that deep anger that I couldn't let go of was anger at myself for allowing myself to be so completely brainwashed. And so now I just, the self-talk is where it used to be so negative. Now I say, honey, you, you did the best you could do. Like I was talking, like I talked to my child self. Honey, you, you did a great job and you're only human and you'll do better. We have to forgive ourselves because we're meant to be living lives of joy and we're meant, and, we're, and none of us knows what's going on. The truth is we don't know what's going on here. We think we do, but we don't. And if we could realize we're really just children in these more adult bodies, then we just get to have fun, you know, and when we get to make mistakes. And, and I think when we're kind, then our mistakes are pretty pure, you know? So I know Terry had a question, did you? So you were in this relationship for seven years? Seven years. And you said you had early signals. So I had you know, early signals, yes. What was the singular, was there a singular event where you were able to speak to, to power, where you just said, hey, something's not right? There were a couple of those. The one was, so she had, the spiritual teacher had a man that also ran the business with her, who was her first student and her most devoted. And when I started running the business, I started working for him. He was 12 years older than I was. And eventually, I spent all my time with him. And then he started seducing me and um, took me on as his consort. And a consort is when a spiritual teacher has a sexual relationship with a student. And, and because I was so undone at that time and I had no support system and my whole life was them, I was attracted but wasn't, but kind of into him but not really. And then I realized this might really help me change to become enlightened. Um, and so I tried to be his lover and romantic partner and he was a narcissist and he was terrible. And finally, I remember one day walking into his house. So I was cleaning his house, doing his grocery shopping, doing his errands paying them money every month, cleaning her house. And I walked into his house once to do more cleaning or cooking or something, and I asked for my sandals. And, and he said, well, they're in the garage. And I said, why are they in the garage? And he said, because I can't look at your sandals without you being my attention and, and making my attention impure. And I thought, okay, here's this man that is sleeping with me and can have his body inside mine, but he can't look at my sandals. And I said, enough. I can't do this anymore. I don't care if I don't ever become enlightened. I cannot do this anymore. And, that, and with that, my power and my clarity came back. But then I was ostracized and shamed. And I had nothing left. And I started to think, oh my gosh, I made a huge mistake. My ego is so big. I sh and I was reading about Sri Ramakrishna cleaning latrines with his hair to sand out. And so I just thought, I am failing. I'm falling off this path. I just. And so I went back. Did you have help? 
I did have help. I got a great therapist. <laughs> Um, I realized I needed help, and I got a professional therapist, and she was wonderful because she said, because I kept saying, oh, everything that happened to me happened for me, and I know it's all good, and she said, Renee, stop trying to handle this like a saint, and you need to express some rage here. And so she really encouraged the rage to come through and the anger, and that was incredibly healing, and that's when I realized as humans we have the dark and the light, and we have all the love and the kindness, and we have all the hate and all of that, and we have to be able to, children are masters of emotion. They let it come running through them and out, and they're done with it in 90 seconds. That's what studies say. But because we don't let it come through and out, we hold it inside, and it becomes disease and self-destructive behavior. Um, so she really encouraged me to scream into pillows and to punch punching bags and to write. She encouraged all the writing. And that was incredibly liberating. Um, and then I started telling friends and family, and then they started to support me. So, and it's taken five, it's, it'll be six years in January, and I'm just coming out the other side. Stronger and better than ever. <laughs> and I think that we incarnate with this incredible emotional guidance system. So when we feel joy and peace and love and passion and excitement, we know we're on the right path. And when we feel anger or fear or frustration, it's very powerful guidance, that, especially anger, that our boundaries have been crossed. And so I think it's incredibly important to act on that anger because then you go, the person I'm interacting with or the situation that I'm in right now is causing this incredible anger. That's, that's guidance saying, turn the, you know, make a change. Um, and so we absolutely have to express all of it. We are all of it in human bodies. We're dark and light. I thought the spiritual version of me was going to be this saintly version that just, I don't know, like it floated around in a white robe with a daisy behind my ear and only was happy. And what I finally realized is the most enlightened version of me is me as loud and bright and broken as I am. And the most enlightened version of all of you is that too, like the, like the child version of you, the four-year-old that, you know, as women, we're taught, oh, don't get your dress dirty. And, you know, and it's like, no, it's the, the child that's rolling in the mud in her dress or, you know, the little boy that wants to cry because he, because he wants to play with a doll instead of a truck. And, um, and so I think that especially in spiritual groups like that, you think, oh, it's supposed to be suffering. I don't, I don't think so. I think life is supposed to be joy. And I think that we find joy when we're true to ourselves. And when we stop worrying about what everyone else thinks about us and we just do what makes us happy because what makes each one of you happy is different than what makes me happy. You know, and it's the tiny things, whether it's a cup of your favorite hot liquid or a walk that you love or a song that you love. And for me, the way to healing was to start honoring those things because what one of you loves, another one doesn't love. And what one of you irritates you, you know. And so, and then when you start living your life with all those tiny little pieces that bring you so much joy, you start living a life of joy. And what I found about being saint-like, because I, I like to wear knee-high boots and dance on a bar and spin around a stripper pole, but I'm an ordained monk, you know, and... Um, <laughs> And I like to drink tequila. And I, so I thought I was going to, if I meditated enough, I was going to blast through this portal and suddenly be enlightened. And what I realized is, no, it's a choice every day. I can leave a larger tip. I can leave early so I'm not a jerk in traffic. I can open the door for somebody who has packages in their hands. I can smile when I am so sad I just want to cry. I can listen when I just can't bear to hear somebody continue talking. And that I have this choice every day to do these tiny little things that make me saint-like. And then I get to drink tequila and dance on a bar and you know do the things that make my spirit shine and spread light because I do think when we interact with each other energetically we're either handing balls of light to each other or we're handing balls of darkness and it's the kindness it's the light and you have to love yourself to do it I think innocent people always attract people or situations that challenge them in a certain way it's very true, and, and it keeps happening. But what's fascinating is that's where the emotion comes in, because those of us that are innocent, we're hypersensitive. 
And so we have this incredible emotional guidance system. So we know immediately when somebody we're interacting with is crossing our boundaries, but we're trained out of it from childhood. We're trained out of that. So when you honor that again, you know, we're taught, and this is, the, this is kind of the flip with spirituality, you're taught to be so kind and be so nice. And yes, you can be kind and nice, but you have to have really strong boundaries. And I'll be kind and nice to someone who's kind and nice, but the second someone comes up who's going to not be nice or hurt me, my boundaries come up and they don't even get to talk to me. And I, I think learning to enforce boundaries takes time, but then you, because you think people are going to think I'm a bitch or they're going to think I'm mean. And what I realize is it's actually incredibly um, comfortable for people because they know immediately where they stand with me. There's no guessing. You talked about forgiving yourself. Yes. Loving yourself. How about the other person? Did you ever get to the point where you forgave them? I completely forgave them to the point that the Today Show emailed me and wanted me to come on. And as a new author, that is every new author's dream. It came right into my email box. We want you on the Today Show. We're sending a camera crew to your house. They sent the camera crew to the house. They did the whole backstory. And then I was going to New York, and they said, we need you to reveal the names. And I said, I'm not revealing the names. I disguised them. And they said, well, we need it just to fact check. And I said, well, put that in writing and I'll think about it. And then they said, well, the way we fact check is we call these people up and have them on the show. And I said, no. My entire journey has been to find peace, and I found it. And the biggest part of my peace was forgiveness, and I'm not letting you call them. And I mean, it, that's some serious forgiveness, because I turned down selling probably, I don't know, thousands of books. So complete, total forgiveness, because the truth is, they shattered me, and out the other side is the true me. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. But you also turned down drama. I was like, my life is beautiful and peaceful in the mountains, and you're going to turn it into a he said, she said mess. So no. So that you can have viewers for a week or something? No. So you, know, you said that you uh, deprogrammed yourself twice, and the first time was Catholicism. And I was probably five or six when I realized the church wasn't for me. And it was because I loved singing. When I was in church, I loved to sing, and my heart would open up, and I'd sing about Jesus. But I thought he was Jesus because I loved cheese, and I pictured this big piece of American cheese in the sky. <laughs> and, um, and, and then there would be this man on the pulpit who looked like he hadn't had fun a day in his life ever trying to tell me about joy and God and I just and then everybody parroting back and also to you or whatever we had to say and I just said this I Jesus the big piece of cheese in the sky does not want us to just be sitting here in these stiff chairs repeating after this white man who doesn't seem like he does anything about happiness and um and then the other thing about Buddhism was they introduced something called the occult, which they said were dark forces that mess with our minds. And when you get so bright from meditating, these dark forces are going to come in and want you to leave the path. And, um, and that was very damaging for me because then suddenly I'm walking through the world scared of everything and everybody. And I think our minds are so malleable. And anytime anybody introduces self-doubt or fear, it, they, it just spreads. It just spreads. And so I realized through all of this is that we are born with this unique ability to connect to source on our own. We don't need anybody else. And it's nice to have teachers and guides that remind us of that. But when that person says, you need me to find God, and, and I think for me, what I notice with the church is the things that really bring us to to still our minds, when we still our minds, we feel that peace. We feel God. We feel the love we're made of. And activities like sex, when you're completely in love with somebody and you're having an orgasm and your mind stops, it's this beautiful, bright moment. They say that's bad because, you know, heaven forbid you find God and peace and love on your own without, you know, some needing somebody else. So... I guess to wrap that, that answer up, I would just say we all have the ability to get quiet and feel what's right for us and to feel our own connection to source. And we don't need anyone else 
to do that for us. And I think anytime we're in a situation where we deify another human being, whoever that human being is, we're in trouble. Once you start having the courage to tell the story, there's a tend to overshare, right? And it really is a walk of power, I think, to have gone through, I call it a crucible, and that's part of where the name the burn zone comes from. It's a crucible that you've been through when you've been through something like that. And so then I found you do want to be careful with that because, um, you know, for example, I went to see Hamilton in New York and it was amazing and I wasn't prepared at all. I'd heard about it, but I wasn't prepared at all for what it were, really was. And then after, and it changed me completely. Um, and then afterwards I tried to tell people about it and they just couldn't get it. I mean, there's no way to describe the experience I had had. And so then I felt kind of yucky because I thought, oh, it was so amazing and now it just is falling flat. And so I think with these incredible walks of power that you've been through, um, you want to be careful who you share it with. You do want to share it with people who really get it. Um, but it's so important to write it, I think, to write it out, to get it out, and then to be proud of it, and then to gain the wisdom from it. And you'll find that then you'll be drawn, people will be drawn to you that can benefit from the lessons you learned from it, and that's when you know to share. Have you <clears throat> encountered people from the cult since leaving it? And like, if you have, how, does, how has that gone? Like, I did cross paths with actually one of my best friends from childhood who I talked, her, her name's Jessica in this book. She's the one that helped me burn everything I own. And um, I, I, I crossed paths with her and I was so excited to see her because I hadn't been allowed to contact anyone from the group. And she pretended she didn't know who I was. And then she looked at me like I was gonna pull out a wand and turn her into a frog. And it's because the teacher, once I was out of the group, said I was the devil and a witch and a sorceress. And she believed it. And I cried and I cried and I cried. And then I realized if anyone, and this is the forgiveness, if anyone can understand how powerful these people are at mind control, I can. So I have to understand how she can believe her childhood friend is the devil. And she needs to believe what she needs. There's a reason that belief serves her. And so I just refuse to say anything negative about her and just love her and just, that's her thing. Yes. Do I feel responsibility for bringing people into this group? And what I realized, I just, I believe in a divine plan and I believe that we sign up on some level to go through these trials and that people who are in these groups are gonna learn what they need to learn from it. And again, my therapist was so helpful because in New York, my, he was my boyfriend and business partner and, and not a good person. And I said, well, I think I need to make sure that every woman out there knows he's not a good person. And she said, Renee, after I read that Laura Bobbitt cut off her husband's penis and then remember that and then threw it out the window and then he had it surgically reattached and then some other woman signed up to date him within you know, a couple months. She said, there will always be women that want to date these really abusive men because they have something to learn from those relationships. She said, it's not your job to save women from him. It's your job to just help encourage women to not allow themselves to be treated badly ever. Did you ever think about how they learned the techniques of mind control? I, well, I didn't realize, obviously, that it was mind control. And then once I got out of it, I looked up mind control. And I saw that they did every, there was maybe 10 steps, and they did everything in it. And, and maybe I'm naive. I don't know for sure that they meant to. Maybe they're just narcissists that really, I know that when she meditated in a room, there was a lot of light. I don't know where that came from. And maybe it's just that I stilled my mind and it was light coming through me. I don't know. But I, I and I say that at the end of the book, I say, I will never know if they really meant to just control people and have them sitting at their feet or if they really thought they were spreading light. I don't know. And I don't care. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be just one or the other. Yeah, I don't know. I, but I do think there are a lot of narcissists out there that really, and I think when we're hypersensitive and we're seekers, we're drawn to that because we think they know something that, you know, they know something that I don't. I read about codependency, and the definition is you make the relationship more important than you make yourself. And so 
you have to make yourself more important than the relationship. And what I learned is when we're constantly trying to please others, we're not an authentic version of ourselves. So then what we attract into our lives doesn't really fit us. It fits this fake version. And so the more true you are to yourself, the better boundaries you have. You might piss off the people that are used to you doing everything for them. But what will happen is they'll start to leave, and you'll feel lonely and afraid. But nature abhors a vacuum. So then what will come into that space is people that empower you and cherish you. And then as you become more and more true to who you are, the people that liked the fake version of you will start to leave. And what you'll draw to you are people who adore the real version of you. So I want us all, I would love you all to take away that you're perfect just the way you are, that you're really beautiful, and that you're constantly bombarded by messaging that tells you you're not. Men, I mean, men, you're beautiful too, you know, it's not. And so the mind, it takes vigilance of mind to realize that especially the parts about you that you hid as a child, those are the keys to your destiny. And as you start to let those parts of you out, it's so fun. It's really fun. And, and then especially women, um, I, we have this beautiful divine light inside of us, and we're told after a certain age that we're no longer beautiful. And it's the opposite. As we gain wisdom through life, we become more and more beautiful. So the older we get, the more powerful we get, and the more beautiful we get. And so it's up to us to turn that light switch back on and to let it come through us and out. Um, and then we bring our light, this bright light, to the planet. So I say, Lakshmi and Vishnu taught me to fear others, to separate myself from them, to push them away. And I'm reading this because this is what I think has a lot to do with when we're on a search for enlightenment. Um, to disdain anyone that was not on the same path I was on. I became isolated. I became cold. I became distant. I became self-righteous. I became judgmental. I became mean. They taught me to hate myself, to hate every part of myself that was unspiritual, to hate every part of myself that was human. The more I hated myself, the more I hated others, and the more I hated others, the more I attracted hateful people into my life. This is how I got so incredibly taken advantage of in New York. This is how I let hate begin to consume me. Mind control is no joke. It's incredibly damaging. Planting seeds of self-doubt and hatred into other people's minds is the antithesis of spreading light. And it amazes me that it could happen to me, that it could happen to my friends, that it can happen to anyone if we allow others to tell us who we are. In New York, I had a quote on my desk from St. Catherine of Siena. It said, be who God meant you to be and you will set the world on fire. I would look at that quote every day and say to myself, sometimes out loud, but always in great emotional pain, I don't know who God meant me to be. I have no idea what to be, what to do with my life. I'm so unhappy and I feel so small. If I knew who God meant me to be, I would do it. I would love to set the world on fire. And then I would go about my day. One day my eyes landed on that quote and love popped into my head. Simply the word love. And then I got it. God meant me to be love. A walking, breathing, living manifestation of love. God meant for all of us to be love. When we love ourselves, we love others. And when we love others, we bring out the best in them. We create a beautiful, safe space for the vulnerable, gooey, raw parts to come out from behind the ego and shine. And the truth suddenly showed itself after I had spent a lifetime searching, love. My search for God led me through hell and back. I destroyed myself. I destroyed all I loved. And the most important thing I got out of all of it at the end was this. When I love, I feel God. When I'm grateful, I feel God. When I'm giving and kind and patient and caring and compassionate, I feel God. The rest doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. And the key to feeling love and kindness and patience and compassion is loving and accepting, completely accepting myself. God made me. She wants me to be me with all the flaws and cracks and broken bits. And he wants me to be happy. She wants all of us to be happy, and he wants us to love each other. When we love each other, we create heaven on earth. When we don't, we create hell. It's up to us. It's always been up to us. And then the boundaries come in, because then you can take that to the extreme and be so loving that you let people treat you like crap. 
So when I learned the stronger my boundaries were, the more I could open my heart. But so my answer to all of that is when we just, we are love. That's what we are. We're love. And everything else is just experiencing life on Earth in a human body, in my opinion. And so we will we'll never get it right, and we never get it done, and we just experience hot, cold, and hate, and love, and pleasure, and pain, and, and we just go, wow. But I think we can spend so much time searching for enlightenment that we miss living. When I was in this group, I was meditating two hours a day, and then I realized now, you know, we're in bodies to live in bodies, not to just sit and be in light all the time. So I meditate every morning, and, um, and I, nature really helps reset me, and then physical activity. But every day I'm working on the crap that comes in my mind, looking in the mirror and thinking I'm ugly, thinking I'm old, thinking, you know, this or that, or my body, you know, and, um, and so I, for me, that never went away. It's just a strength. So then I counter it, and I look in the mirror, and I go, honey, you're so beautiful. And I think of what I would say to my, if I was a child, would I tell her, a three-year-old, the three-year-old version of me, you're ugly? No. I'd say, honey, you're beautiful. <laughs> so meditation, being in nature. But, but for you, it's like you already know what brings you joy and what resets you. It might be certain music. It might be, you know, a certain activity. But I, but I know that if we do that, then we can reset. The enlightenment, the self-realization of who you really are is a great thing because then you live life more fully, not taking it, not being so fearful and not being so attached to pleasures and fear of not pleasures because you know that's not who you really are anyway. You right, know right, right, right. And it comes in and out, which is fascinating, because when you're clear, when you have that clarity, you realize this is just an experience and it's all going to be over. But then when you don't have that clarity, you're really in it. And what's happening right now really, really matters. And you're terrified. And, um, and it reminds me of the Wizard of Oz, how she could just click her heels three times and go home. And I realized we can leave at any moment, you know, but we're here now. And so let's just try to enjoy it. But, but I, I do think that that's part of the experience, that we go into the clarity of knowing that we're just love and light, and then we completely lose it and get completely wrapped up. And then there's that relief when you remember that it's not all that serious. So, yeah, I go in and out all the time. Yes? I've got a comment on the, uh, or a question on the PTSD. Okay. How long after you left did you realize, hey, you know, I need to... It control all the lead, or I need to uh, <laughs> reset here. Something's not right. I had, well, it's fascinating as I had a near death experience. I had a snowboarding accident that should have killed me. Yeah. And I, I should have broken my neck and just instantly gone. And I tucked my neck and rolled and um, out of it. And by the end of that day, the life I was living was wrong. I didn't want to be in New York. I didn't want to be in school. I didn't want to own the business I owned. I didn't want to be dating the person I was dating. I wanted to move to the mountains and write. Um, and so with that clarity that I was so far from what felt right for me came the clarity that I had, was completely brainwashed. And, um, and then the, the business partner in New York that I was suing, he took some of the emails I had written him and put them in the New York Post, which I learned, don't put anything in writing that you don't want published in a newspaper. Um, and when I read what I had written to him, I mean, he edited them, but when I read all of my thoughts from the group through my emails to him, I realized, wow, yeah. So yes. how is that PTSD? Like what symptoms? Because my understanding of that disorder is somewhat different than all of what you just said. Well, for me, the PTSD was all the teaching on the occult and the dark forces, and um, and that people would come up and try to steal my energy, and or that these dark forces would be messing with my mind, and so then I wasn't able to trust people anymore, and. For example, they just introduced, if you sleep in a hotel bed, you'll feel everyone that ever slept in the bed. And, and I, because I'm so psychic and such an empath, I did. Or, um, um, and so then I couldn't, I couldn't 
be in the world anymore. I had to be isolated. And so I had to deprogram all of that. Like, you know, if, if I'm made by the divine and I'm in a human body and I'm in this world, I should be able to handle this world. And I should be able to be so bright that I bring light to any situation. I don't suck in all the darkness. So I had to go, yes, you can sleep in a hotel bed. Yes, you can sleep on a pillow. Um, so for me, Anytime, and then the boundaries things came up. Anytime I would be talking with somebody who my guidance told me is not a good person, I instead of just trusting that this just person is a narcissist and I shouldn't interact with them, I'd go, well, maybe they're good, and maybe it's just me. Oh, but maybe there are dark forces, or maybe they're actually super bright, and my ego's saying, don't, you know. So instead of just, no, I mean, I don't like the way I feel around this person. Simple. Doesn't mean the person's bad. I just want to walk away. So for me, that was a lot of the, and then feeling that I was a witch and a sorceress, so undoing that too. Thanks. I hope that didn't sound confrontational. No, no, no. It wasn't no, intended that way, no. but it sounded kind of yeah. weird. No, because I think PTSD is when you just, I mean, for me, it was when you don't want to be the person you are now. I wanted to go back to being the person I was before. And now I realize I love the person I am now. So, yes, Ed. So did you think that was one of the 10 things? Uh, the mind control thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I forget what it was. I mean, I forget what I looked up, but they say that you, you manipulate all the time, you make people sleep deprived, you introduce like um, beta waves or alpha waves in the brain through the meditating. Um, then you introduce shame, self-doubt, um, and then ostracizing people that leave. And I forget what else. Yes. Yeah. What do you think like made you strong enough to detach from that? Because it sounds like that was like your entire life. And I think I think I got lucky in the fact that the te the female teacher, when she found out I was the consort of the male teacher, gave me an impossible task. She said, "Go get an MBA from one of the hardest business schools, and then start a business that makes ten million dollars profit after taxes, and then you can come back to the group." And so with that distancing, and again, it's like a toxic relationship when you actually do get the physical distance away. Because when you give your power away, you lose your clarity and your energy. And with the clarity and energy gone, then you don't have the, the strength to make the change. And you don't have the clarity to see that you have to. It's, and so that physical distancing helped me at least detach some. And then the shattering with the business situation helped me detach more. But so really to get out of any toxic relationship, I think you do have to remove yourself physically, just go on vacation for a week or something, you know, and then you start to see it more clearly. So are we done? Thank you all so much. I loved you all. I loved having you here.